it's funny, I, I'm originally from Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, we got people from Boston in the house. Let's go. Uh, but, but, but about seven years ago, I repented of snow and cold and ice storms. I, I repented of all that, and I moved down to the South. Anybody from the South? Any? There we go. Okay. I moved to North Carolina, okay? I moved to North Kakalaki, and uh, it's funny, you know, when you move from up north to the south, it's a culture shock, you know what I'm saying? First thing is, you know, uh, everyone just says hi and hello. Everyone talks to strangers in the south, and that was weird for my Bostonian brain, you know what I'm saying? I'm kind of like, strangers don't talk to you up north. It's too cold, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and I gained 25 pounds in about three months, because ain't no Chick-fil-A up north. We ain't got none of that. Southerners fry everything. Like, I was down south, I was, people frying lettuce, frying spinach, frying stuff that I don't think should even be fried. But, but, but one of the most interesting uh, cultural differences is that when, when I was living in Boston, Massachusetts, nobody, and I mean no one, owns a personal firearm. In Bo See, y'all confused. All, all the Texans in the room like, huh? <laughs> Bostonians do not own guns, okay? If you live in Boston, if you're from Boston and you own a gun, that means one of two things, okay? There's only two possibilities. You are either in a gang, okay? You rob people or you are in the police, you are a part of the police force. That's the only thing that means. But then I moved, woo, to North Carolina. And everybody and their grandmama in law got a gun in North Kakalaki. I mean, everybody. So I'm at my friend Anderson's house, and Anderson wanted to show me all nine. <laughs> nine of his guns, okay? He had a gun for his hip, he had a gun for his ankle, he had a gun for his wife's pocketbook, I mean. And my Bostonian brain, okay, I didn't know how to understand or interpret this social situation. I didn't know whether or not Anderson was saying, I'm not the dude to mess with. <laughs> I didn't know if he was threatening me. Or if Anderson was saying, bruh, if you ever find yourself in a jam, I'm the guy to call. Like, I didn't know, I didn't know what to, I didn't know what to think. So he, he then, you know, after showing me handguns, my man showed me a, a rifle, a hunting rifle. I learned quickly that in North Carolina, we eat Bambi, okay? That's, <laughs> we eat Bambi, all right? Uh, we call it a fancy name. We call it venison, you know what I'm saying? But Bambi gets eaten, okay? Uh, we put it in chili, we put it in all types of lasagna, you know. But then he showed me his shotgun. Now at this point, I was over it, okay? I was over all, I was over it. I felt threatened, I didn't know how to feel. I'm from Boston, I'm confused, like, and I said, bro, like, this just seems, this seems excessive, man, you know? And I said, but why the shotgun, bro? Like, why the shotgun? And I mean, Anderson's from the country. I mean, barely wore shoes, like just a bumpkin, okay? Just a bumpkin. Almost, he tried to buy a golf cart for his own personal property. Like, that's just country. That's on a whole nother level. <laughs> and I said, why the shotgun? And he said, Manny, you, you don't know nothing. You're from Boston. I'm like, yep, that's true. He said, a shotgun is the best gun for home defense. I said, for real, teach me something, Anderson. He said, the reason that a shotgun is the best gun for home defense is because if I heard someone on the outside of my house trying to break into my house, if I heard someone on the outside of my house tinkering with my lock, trying to invade upon my personal property, if I heard a thief trying to steal, kill, or destroy me or my family or, or any of my personal belongings, all I would have to do is grab the shotgun. And all I'd have to do is move to the inside of the very same door that they are trying to intrude upon. And the moment they hear this sound, they would become keenly aware that they've messed with the wrong house that night. As Anderson was speaking to me physically, the Holy Ghost started speaking to me spiritually, letting me know that it is the sound that we release from the inside of the house that lets the enemy know you messed with the wrong church this morning. I don't know if
if depression chased you in here, but we are declaring that the name of the Lord is a strong tower that the righteous run in and find safety. So we are not just doing Christian karaoke. Oh no, baby. When we worship and when we praise, we're creating a force field around your life. So we declare peace over your life and joy over your life and freedom over your life. Praise always precipitates breakthrough. And I know a story in the Bible where Paul and Silas began to praise, and I would take a lap around the whole high thigh if the Bible said that as Paul and Silas worshiped, their prison doors came open. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says as they began to praise, every prisoner that was in prison, everybody's prison doors came open, which means this worship is the most selfless thing you can do because your hallelujah on this side of the room means breakthrough for somebody that's sitting over there and your praise up there in the balcony means, means breakthrough for somebody on the front row. See, when we begin to praise, we create an atmosphere. And when we change the atmosphere, it starts raining and everybody gets wet, baby. <laughs> everybody gets wet when the atmosphere changes. Man, I'm, I'm, I'm super excited to be here. Man, uh, we already honored Pastor Robin Taylor, but it came out of Pastor Jordan's mouth, not mine. So I, can, I could not stand on this stage and be a guest without honoring your pastors. Pastor Robert, Pastor Taylor, man, I love these people, okay? Uh, these people are friends of mine, and uh, I look up to Pastor Robert as a mentor, as a big brother. I've stolen so many of his sermons. Uh, it, it, man, I, I really, I, I, I gave in the offering because I'm like, at least I could give in this offering because I have stolen so much of this man's material. It is really sad, okay? And so I'm super, super honored to be here. Man, can we clap it up for our senior pastors, for Pastor Robert and Taylor? In their absence, we still want to honor them. Man, I love them. I love them dearly. I love them dearly. Anybody ready for the word this morning? Anybody ready for the word? Awesome. Balcony, y'all ready for the word? Y'all ready for the word? Okay, good. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to, to, to preach if y'all ready to eat. Like, I'm ready to cook if y'all ready to eat. Um, and uh, we're going we're gonna to talk about faith today. Faith today. Okay, faith. Uh, because I don't know if you're anything like me. Uh, the moment that disappointment sets in, if you don't attack disappointment with faith, disappointment has this ability to turn into doubt. And over time, doubt, if you don't tackle doubt, okay, doubt turns into unbelief. And uh, you, can, you can be a Christian for a long time, but your faith can be on cruise control. Your faith can be on autopilot. So I wanna speak to your doubt today and your disappointment today. I wanna speak to you if you've been struggling with unbelief. Maybe you've just, you're, you're, you're in the room, you're a Christian. Maybe you're not even a believer. Maybe you, you're not a Christian. I wanna to preach to your faith, okay? We wanna to speak to your faith like it's Lazarus. And we're saying, faith, come on, come alive again. We're speaking to your faith. Maybe there's been some disappointments in your life. Me and my wife, we walked through a season of infertility for about six years. We miraculously got pregnant, but then we had a miscarriage. And I remember having a, like, I mean, shovel up the broken pieces of my faith. I wonder if I'm pre preaching to anybody already. Who, like, at some point, your faith has been like shattered glass, and you have had to gather yourself and all your emotions and all your feelings, and come on, muster up faith again. But can I tell you this? My wife is 38 weeks pregnant right now with a miracle baby. Come on, because God can do anything. He can do anything. He can do anything. He's the God of the impossible. What man says is impossible is possible with God. He can do anything. I don't know what a loan officer has said to you, but God can do anything. I don't know what your student loans have said to you, but God can do anything. I don't know what your biological clock has said to you, but God can do anything. I don't know what statistics have said to you, but God can do anything. I don't know what your fears or your insecurities have said to you or whispered into your ear, but we declare truth over your life today that God can do anything. He actually enjoys, like he gets a kick out of defying odds. He's like, oh, ho, ho, impossibilities? I love impossibilities. 
So we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. A lot of people know Hebrews chapter 11 as the hall of faith, okay? Hebrews chapter 11. And we're going to go to verse 30, verse 31. Anybody got a physical Bible? Come on, anybody got a physical Bible? Where are my AP honors Christians at? There we go. There we go. There we go. <laughs> if you got a physical Bible, go to Hebrews chapter 11. And we're going to read verse 30 and 31. But before we get there, I kind of have to set up Hebrews chapter 11 because the entire chapter of the Bible, this is kind of one of those famous chapters of the Bible, kind of like 1 Corinthians 13 is like the chapter about love, right? Hebrews chapter 11 is this entire chapter about faith. And I love verse 6. I don't have verse 6 on the screens, but I'm going to say it because I've memorized it. Woo! The Bible says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists that he rewards those who earnestly and diligently seek him. Come on, we're gonna just kind of say this together. And without faith, it is impossible. To what? Jesus. Come on, to what? Jesus. And without faith, it is impossible to what? Jesus. Please God. You know, you know, in my Christian journey, I feel like this is one of the passages that we, it's almost like it comes into our minds, it gets scrambled, and we reinterpret it a whole different way. In Christian circles, you wanna know what we actually subconsciously believe? That in without faith, it is impossible to get miracles. And without faith, it is impossible to accomplish breakthrough. And without faith, it is impossible for this outcome to happen. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, and without faith, it is impossible to what? Please God. Can I help our theology this morning? The number one reason that you need faith is because faith pleases God. And every single time, all the six years that we went through infertility, I bought a crib, I bought a onesie, I bought onesies in almost every airport I went through. We did IVF and we had a miscarriage. And the enemy wanted to lie to me and say this, your faith was a waste. See? See, because when you have faith for outcomes, the enemy can always slip in and tell you that faith is a waste. But we don't have faith for results. We have faith for a relationship with God. Faith pleases God. So even when you exercise faith and the thing you wanted doesn't happen, you can still say, my faith was never a waste because my faith pleased God. That is what faith is meant to do. Oh, I need a couple more amens in the room. Because get this, boo-boo, God is not your genie. He's your God. And we're not spiritual gold diggers. We don't exercise faith so that God can give us our stuff. We don't exercise faith so that God can do the trick. We don't exercise faith so that we can get things out of the cosmic vending machine. We exercise faith because faith pleases God. We exercise faith because faith makes you mature. We exercise faith because when we get a hold of faith, we declare, I'm not going to live my life on cruise control. I'm not going to, here we go, deny that I even want what I'm praying for. Oh, come on. Most of us have become spiritual Christian Buddhists. Uh-oh. Trying to reach some state of nirvana where we don't want stuff no more. We struggle with infant. Can I be real in here? Can I preach, preach? Can I be real? <laughs> We struggled with infertility for so long that the enemy tried to get me to declare that I didn't even want kids. Come on, come on. And the first thing that I had to declare was this. Number one, my faith is designed to please God. So I've got to have like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego faith. Even if God doesn't, I know he will, but even if he doesn't, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, I ain't never bowing down to you. Oh. Unbelief, I'm never bowing down to you. Doubt, I'm never bowing down to you. Even if he doesn't, God, I want you, the giver, more than the gift. Second thing, I cannot lie about whether or not I really want this thing. God, I want children. And I'm going to call it, because some of us, we're afraid. Uh-oh, uh uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. Can I step on toes? See, the opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is certainty. You want to know what a lot of us want? We want a guarantee. Okay, if I sing these songs and memorize these Bible verses. Okay, now if I give 10%, will I get a job? You know what I'm saying? Come on, come on. Which means you don't want a relationship with God. That's a religion, boo-boo. That's called regiment. And God says this, can you tithe even with no promise of anything happening? Can you just tithe because you're grateful to me? 
can you, can you be generous because I'm generous and you want my character in your life? Okay, come on, come on, come on. I got ADHD. Stop distracting me. We got to go. Because <laughs> there's a clock over there. I got 30 minutes and 13 seconds. And my wife told me that you're preaching for Robert and Taylor at social. You need to be on your best behavior, okay? <laughs> Pastor, she gave me a whole pep talk. So, and, and dad, I'm just calling you dad because you, you're dad. So, Y'all keep me in check. Okay, here we go. Let's go. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Okay, uh, we're, we're going to do call and response, okay? If, if I don't say a word, that's your opportunity to say the word that I don't say, okay? Here we go. Okay, by faith. Oh, come on, everybody. By faith. Okay, the walls of Jericho fell after the army had marched around them for seven days. Okay, by faith. The prostitute, the prostitute, uh-oh. The, pr woo -woo. Woo. the prostitute, the, pr the Bible didn't put this woman's business all out in the streets, okay? <laughs> the Bible could have used a euphemism. The Bible could have said a woman that was sinful, a woman of the night. No, no, a prostitute, a sex worker, okay? Like, the Bible's better than TMZ, okay? Anybody who says that the Bible is boring, you're reading the wrong book, okay? Because if you like sex scandals and incest and murder, the Bible's the book for you, okay? This, this, thing, this thing got a lot of stuff in it, okay? Okay, so the prostitute. Here we go. The prostitute, what's her name? Because she welcomed the was not killed with those who were disobedient. And, 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 and so now we've, we've got background. We're gonna talk about this woman named Rahab. We also have to talk about Joshua because for a lot of us, there's a promise, there's a vision, there's a land of promise that God has for you. Come on, God's delivered you out of Egypt. There's a promised land in front of you, but you're stuck right now on the doorsteps of Canaan. And I hope that this sermon just pushes you in, okay? We got one more chapter to read, Joshua chapter two. Joshua chapter two, we've kind of gotten a New Testament perspective on Rahab and Joshua, and now we're gonna go to the Old Testament, and we're gonna go, we, I just, yep, there we go. Joshua chapter two, verse 15. Uh, now we know that the she is who, what's her name? Rahab. Rahab, okay? So Rahab let them down by a rope through the? Window. Come on, through the? Window. Through the? Window. Through the window? I, I, didn't, I never knew this, Pastor Jordan. Got a, got a, went through seminary, never knew this. Here we go. For the house that Rahab lived in was part of the city wall. You know, I never knew that the walls of Jericho were so large, so thick, so wide, that they put apartments in that mug. Now, in Boston, we just call that the projects. That's what we call that, you know what I'm saying? That's called the bricks, okay? But Rahab's home is set within the walls of Jericho. I don't know if you ever knew that. I never knew this. Here we go. For the, for the house she lived in was part of the city wall. So she said to them, go to the hills so the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourselves there three days until they return and then go on your way. I want to tell you my title this morning. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. But this isn't just a title. I believe it's a prophetic declaration over your life, whatever season of life that you're in. Here's my title today. Come on. There's a window in the wall. There's a window in the wall. Oh, come on. Rahab's home is in the wall of Jericho, but she lets the spies down through her window. Can I preach this real quick? Okay, come on. There's walls that the enemy has set up to keep you out of your destiny and out of your promise. Come on, walls of oppression and walls of statistical uh, ideology that doesn't let you go enter in. Come on, walls of infertility. Come on, walls of disease. Come on, walls of poverty, walls of doubt. But for every wall of opposition, I believe today that God is declaring a window of opportunity over your life. Come on. I'm not going to see the walls. I'm going to see the windows. Come on. There's a window in the wall. And so God, we need you. I need you to preach this. Help me preach this thing. And God, we're laying hands on our eyes at the beginning of the service, declaring we're not going to see walls. We are going to see windows of opportunity. The enemy has set up walls to keep this church from establishing a foothold in Dallas, but we see windows of opportunity. Come on, buildings and property. God, we see windows. We see your provision. We see windows in our personal life. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, we all say together, amen. amen. I declare over your life, come on, you're going to walk out of church today, not seeing walls, but seeing, come on, what? Windows. windows, come on, seeing windows. Can I just 
let you know this? Come on. Walls are always going to be bigger than windows. What the enemy's doing is always going to be bigger than it, what it looks like God is doing. Yeah. Jesus is like, hey, the kingdom is like a mustard seed. And for some of you, you're like, I wish it wasn't because <laughs> it's hard to see mustard seeds. Come on, let's be real. And God is like, no, 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 no. The walls are always going to be bigger than the windows. You have to make a decision. I see good for me. Come on. I see that my ladder is better than my former. I see that God is moving for me, not against me. I believe that God can do anything in my life. Uh, we got to talk about this woman, Rahab, okay? I can imagine, woo, in my holy imagination, okay? I got a crazy imagination. I just imagine Bible stories, okay? I can imagine Rahab, okay, taking a little walk around the walls of Jericho one day. You know, Rahab's curious about these Hebrew people, about these Israelite people people and, and she knows that these people are, are that God's hand is on them she's a God fearer she's someone who's kind of like I'm not ethnically Jewish but baby there ain't nothing that's gonna keep me out of what God has for me I, I can imagine Rahab Rahab taking a lap around the walls and and Rahab thinking to herself maybe she said this out loud maybe not you know she's just walking around the walls she's a prostitute you know what I'm saying she got a crazy past she got a story but she's she, she sees a window of opportunity for her for her to enter into what God is doing. And you know, this is my version of Rahab's prayer. Rahab prays something like, now God, you know, I ain't really got nothing to offer you. You know what I'm saying? But shoot, God, there's only a couple things I'm good at. And I, if you ever needed somebody to hide some men's and lie about it, I'm your girl, God. I'm your girl, okay? I'm your girl. I don't know if you ever gonna need somebody to do something crazy like that, but I have been uniquely prepared to hide men's and lie about it. And then out of nowhere, Rahab is not thinking that she's gonna get a response from God. And out of nowhere, God goes, well, Rahab. <laughs> Actually, I was just looking for someone to hide some men's and lie about it. See, these Israelite women, they too bougie, Rahab. But you, girl, you are just a prostitute I was looking for. You know what I'm saying? Like, and I know that's funny, but that's Bible that Rahab, her whole claim to fame is that she hid spies and lied about it. And I don't know what lie the enemy has told you that nothing that you learned in the world or before you got saved can be transferred into building God's kingdom. But that is a lie from the devil. No, no, no. God begins to say, what did you learn out there? Okay, you was a party promoter? Okay, you about to be a club promoter. Let's, let's put this, whatever you were, don't lose that energy now that you're saved. Oh, please. No, no, no. Don't lose that energy now that you have been redeemed, that you have been rescued, that you have been set free. Can you realize that I always use the world system to prepare people to build my kingdom? You don't believe me? Okay, okay. Uh, uh, Egypt was the most idolatrous, pagan oriented nation kingdom on the face of the earth more gods than you can count so pagan that God himself opposes Pharaoh and says you set yourself up as a king and as a god before me and I will oppose you and get this God uses the Egyptian educational system to teach a slave who would have been illiterate otherwise how to read and write so that he could create the books of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. You don't believe that God will use the world's money and the world's system and the world's institutions to teach you how to do what you need to do to build God's kingdom? You've never read your Bible. At some point, God is going to look at you and say, see, 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 because here's the lie. The lie is that, no, I'm not saved enough. I don't know enough verses, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know enough Bible verses. Like, I'm not, and God goes, whoa, 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 I use Rahab. I can use you. And sometimes when church gets a little bigger, we can believe this lie. It's called the professionalization of ministry. 
that I've got to have a degree and I've got to have it all right. And then, no, 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 they, they're going to hire people. Boo-boo, no, 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 we, we run on volunteers, okay? This is volunteers, okay? That's the beauty of building a church from the ground up is that we need you to serve. We need you to grab a, 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 a camera, okay? Ain't none of these people trained. We need you. And when the Bible, when the enemy tells you, no, you ain't got a degree and you ain't got this and you ain't got, you look and say, uh-uh, I'm a part of this thing and God doesn't build his kingdom on the gifts of a few but on the sacrifice of many I'm going to what contribute what I've got <laughs> Jordan is funny there's this church I'm not gonna say the church I'm not gonna say the church but I've gone there to preach several times and every single time the pastor invites me there's an immediate yes yeah, I got you. And you, you know why. Here you go. Nobody knows why I really say yes to this church all the time, but y'all about to be in on a little secret, okay? And the reason that I always say yes to this church is because there's this one old white lady at the church who makes homemade Rice Krispies treats <laughs> for the guest speakers, okay? That's her job, okay? That is her job. And I don't know if you've ever had a white woman make you homemade Rice Krispies treats. <laughs> But if you haven't, you're missing out, okay? You shouldn't be allowed to leave earth and enter glory until a white woman, like pre preferably a soccer mom with a minivan, has made you some homemade Rice Krispies treats. And this one lady, that is what she does at this church. And she takes pride in it. Walks into the green room. Did you have my Rice Krispies treats? I'm like, Nancy, you know I had your Rice Krispies treats. Guess what? Here's the lie of the enemy. Making Rice Krispies treats ain't enough. We need you evangelizing. We need you teaching discipleship. No, boo-boo. If you make Rice Krispies treats, if you hide men's and lie about it, guess what? God can use you. God wants you. Whatever your expertise is, whatever you do, guess what? We need it. Whatever you have been uniquely designed and equipped to do, we need Rahab's. We need Nancy's making Rice Krispies treats. We, we need that. Can, I, can we go a little deeper? Can we go a little deeper? Can we go a little deeper? Okay, okay, okay. Rahab is at a crossroads because joining up with these people that she doesn't know about, joining up with the nation of Israel, joining up with Joshua, she is not an Israelite. She is a Canaanite. She is a heathen. She is a pagan. She, she is not a part of the people of God. But here's the lie that the enemy likes to enter into our minds. I'm not going to fit in with them. I'm not going to fit in with them. They know about this thing called the Torah, and they got this Pentateuch thing going on, and I'm not going to fit in with them. And the moment you say that you're not going to fit in with them, you know what that means? It says more about you than it says about them. And maybe you're newly saved. Maybe you're a new Christian. And maybe you're like, I don't know about this church thing. I don't know if I fit in with them. No, no. Yes, you do. You do fit in right here. This is home. And I don't know who I'm preaching to today, but don't let your insecurities define your relationships. You fit in. And, and Rahab's at this crossroads. I, I can relate to this crossroads. Um, uh, maybe about a month ago, I was on my way to Colorado, okay? On my way to Colorado, and I had to get to the airport super, super early because I had a 7 o'clock flight. Okay, and in order to check a bag, you got to get there like an hour before. So I got to the airport at maybe like 5.30 in the morning. God wasn't even awake, you know what I'm saying? I'm just, I'm, I'm, I don't even know how I drove myself to the airport. Me and my wife, we get to the airport. She goes through security, and she doesn't have any bags to check, so she just breezes right through security, and she goes to the gate. She's waiting for me. She's texting me like, hey, you all right? What's going on? And this day, for whatever reason, the line to check bags is just, I mean, ridiculously long. And so 5.30, I get to the airport. 5.45 goes by. 5.50 goes by. Five, uh, 555 hits, 6 a.m. hits. Now, when it hits 6 a.m., I'm thinking to myself, I board in like an hour. This flight takes off in about an hour. I'm going to miss the checkpoint for, for turning in bags. And there's about seven, eight people ahead of me. And I'm stressed. Now, the dude behind me is this white gentleman behind me. And, and he assures me that we're going to make it on the flight. <laughs> I believe this man. He had golf clubs. He was like, you're on the 7 o'clock flight? I was like, yes, I am. He was like, me too. We're going to be fine. I was like, man. 
You look like you got status on American Airlines, bro. You got golf clubs. I, I just trust you. I don't know why I trust you. I trust you, okay? I'm like, you got this. We got this. Me and you, all right? So we get up to the, to, we finally, it's finally our turn. Now, it is 6.30. I've been in this line for an hour. I get up there, and the woman lets me know, you have missed the cutoff time, and I literally went, but... <laughs> I was like, Bob, tell him. <laughs> like, it's like, I'm a black man. I can't be getting angry in public. You, you tell him. You tell him. You, we got to get on the flight. He was like, I, we, I demand. I was like, yes, demand. Yes. <laughs> the word demand is the perfect word here. Yes. Yes. Ask to see a supervisor. I was like, I can, you do it. Let's get us on the flight. Okay. <laughs> he made his demands. And I was just standing there like, I'm with him. We need to get on this flight. And the American Airlines associate talking to us did not care. <laughs> did not care about the church I had to preach at. Did not care about his golf clubs or his demands. Did not care about any of us. So I did what any reasonable person would do. I, I think we would all make the same decision. I realized this is going nowhere. And my flight boards in about 10 minutes. So I went to the bathroom, pretended like I was using the bathroom, went into the handicap stall, left my bag in the bathroom, walked out the bathroom, walked through the airport, got through security, got to the gate, and just told my wife he had all worked out. <laughs> got on the plane. Prayed that TSA did not find me. <laughs> and got to Colorado to fulfill the assignment that was on my life that day. The problem is that many of us would rather have our bags than our flight. Okay. The problem, the problem is that for a lot of you, you are more attached to your stuff than the assignment that God has on your life. For some of us, you are more attached to your unforgiveness and your bitterness and your victim mentality and your sad story about how they hurt you than actually entering to the next season of your life. For a lot of us, you are more attached to a relationship or a friendship or people that you know are not going to get you into your next season than you are in love with the prospect of walking in the fullness of what God has for you. For a lot of you, you're looking at me saying, Sideways, like I can't believe he left a bag. But can I tell you something? Leaving the bag was the most logical thing to do. Because God's kingdom is an upside down kingdom. And until you get a countercultural, rational system of thinking in your mind, leaving a bag will always seem crazy to you. Rahab loses everything. Her home is in the wall of Jericho. All the pictures on the wall, gone. All her friendships, gone. Everything she had worked for, gone. Just to what? Hide some ends. <laughs> and lie about it. Which gave her access into what? It gave her access to now be in a people group that she didn't belong in. There's a cost of entry into the kingdom. It's going to cost you. And then here, here's the end of the story, Pastor Jordan. <laughs> I text uh, the armor bearer who typically travels with me. My wife is with me on this trip, not, not Sam. Sam travels the world with me. I text Sam. It's like 6.30 in the morning. I went to the bathroom on the flight before it took off. I was like, yo, you awake? He's like, yeah, yeah, I'm awake. I was like, I need you to go <laughs> to the handicap stall on the second floor of the Raleigh-Durham International Airport when Sam got there. The bomb squad had been called. <laughs> and Sam had to negotiate with the Raleigh Police Department in order to get my bag back. Can I go a little deeper? Can we go a little deeper? There was nothing sinful in that bag. But if the bag had kept me from my assignment, then although it wasn't sinful, it would have become an idol. 
It doesn't have to be sin in order for you to make it an idol. You can have a good thing and make it an idol. You can have, oh, I know pastors who have made preaching their idol. It doesn't matter if it's a good thing. A good thing abused becomes an idol in your life. For some of you, money ain't a bad thing, but chasing it has become an idol. Not an evil thing. That relationship ain't an evil thing, but you've made it an idol in your life. And as long as it will keep you from getting on the flight of your destiny, then it has become an idol. And Rahab says this, nothing in this house is going to keep me from joining up with the people of God. Nothing in my past is going to keep me from joining up with the people. There is nothing. There's no, I will walk into my next season with nothing, knowing that I just got everything. Ooh, with nothing, with nothing. And maybe you've left church for a long time and you're back. Can I tell you something? You're going to get to a crossroad. Where you're going to have to choose between your stuff and the next season that God has for you. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Can we, can we keep moving? Yeah. Can I talk to you about Joshua? Can we talk about Joshua? Let's talk about Joshua. Okay, I like Joshua. Um, because this is not Joshua's first time on the doorsteps of Canaan. Forty years before the moment that we just read about, Joshua was on the doorsteps of Canaan 40 years prior. Do you remember? Moses sent out 12 spies, right? Joshua and Caleb had a good report. But 10 spies filled the entire nation of Israel with disappointment, with doubt, and unbelief. And so now Joshua, uh-oh, is at the doorsteps of Canaan. But he's been wandering around the wilderness for 40 years. Not because of his lack of faith, but because the lack of faith of the people that he was yoked to. Okay, I got to break down this word yoke, okay? Because one time I was preaching on not being unequally yoked with unbelievers, you know what I'm saying? And this girl came up to me after the service and was like, now, Pastor Manny, now what does eggs have to do with relationships? And I was like, my bad, boo-boo. <laughs> That's my fault. That's the preacher's fault, okay? Not Y-O-L-K, Y-O-K-E, a yoke. Okay, when you're yoked, what a farmer would do is a farmer would put a yoke. It's a wooden apparatus that you would put uh, around the necks of two oxen. And the farmer needs straight rows so that they can come through and what? Sow seed. If you don't get straight rows, then, 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 then it, you can't sow seed. Okay, good. Uh, you helping me. No, we good. This is good. Okay, you need straight rows so that you can... So see, if you yoke a strong ox with a weak ox, the strong ox pulls the weak ox and you don't get straight rows, but you get circles, cycles, wandering. Pastor Robert can give you the best seed in Dallas, but if your boyfriend is pulling you, If your uncle who don't believe in tithing is pulling you. If your friends who want to keep smoking weed with you are pulling you. If, if you're re Okay, okay, you can be a part of Social Dallas, but if your social circle ain't Social Dallas, then there are no seeds that will grow in your life. The seed can't grow unless you have straight rows. See, 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 okay. Joshua had faith. Caleb had faith. But they were yoked with people who what? Were struggling with unbelief. And now Joshua has to spend 40 years in the wilderness because of relationships with people who could not believe on his level. I wish that Joshua had Rahab faith. Faith that said, uh-uh. I ain't about to wander around because of you. Mm -mm. Now, now, the Bible says that they got to wander for 40 years, and I don't know if you know this, but the reason they're wandering around for 40 years is because they got to let that whole generation that was struggling in unbelief die off. Imagine being the last guy in that generation. Everybody just waiting for Joe to die. You know what I'm saying? Everybody's just like, any day now, Joe. Just... 
go ahead, kick the can, bro. <laughs> like, <laughs> Joe finally dies. Joshua's like, let's go. All right, let's go into the land. I've been waiting for this for 40 years. Okay, let me teach you. Here we go. The Bible says this, do not be yoked together with what? Unbelievers. You know what we interpret that to mean? We think that that means don't be yoked together with non-Christians. The Bible doesn't say don't be yoked together with non-Christians. The Bible says don't be yoked together with unbelievers. Do you know that you could be a Christian and still be an unbeliever? You could be a Christian born again, baptized, filled with the power of the Holy Ghost, but you believe in what the loan officer says more than you believe in what God says. You believe in what your student loan report says more than you believe in what God says. You believe what the doctor says more than you believe what God says. At some point, you're going to have to make the decision. I'm not not just a Christian. I'm a believer. I've crossed the threshold into radical faith and I'm a believer. I believe God for the impossible. I believe that he can do what he said he would do. I believe that his promises are yes and amen. I'm a believer. I believe God for signs, miracles, and wonders. I believe God for renewal in my personal life. I believe God that generational curses can break. I believe God for healing. I believe God that I'm the head only and not the tail. I believe God that I am above only and never beneath. I believe that greater is he that is in me than he that's within the world. I believe that I'm more than a conqueror because of his love. I believe what he says about me. I'm not a doubter, I'm a believer. I've met too many Christians too many Christians who are Christians but unbelievers. And then, uh-oh, I've met non-Christians who are believers. Believers. I was on a flight, Dad. I was on a flight. I hope you're okay with me calling you Dad. You Dad. <laughs> I was on a flight, Dad. You know what I'm saying? We travel a lot. We travel so much. And I battled with flight anxiety for two years. It's part of the reason I knew that I was called to, to, to be on the road because I, wherever there's a wall, wherever there's a wall, you know that God has put, you, put a window there. So I knew. I, mean, I was on three to four, sometimes five flights a week battling with flight anxiety. Jittery. If turbulence would break out, I'd almost lose it. Just, just... And, and I'm doing all spiritual stuff, laying hands on planes, you know what I'm saying? Until so God was like, stop that. <laughs> you're doing that in fear. The only reason that you do that is because you're scared. Don't do spiritual things in fear. You do spiritual things in faith. I remember praying through turbulence and God say, stop it. Have God ever stopped your prayer? I was like, God, I thought praying was a good thing. He was like, not in fear. Not in fear. And so I said, whoa, whoa, then how am I supposed to pray? He was like, this is why you have a supernatural prayer language. This is why I filled you when you were 13 and you started speaking in tongues. Because when you speak in tongues, the devil doesn't know how to attack you. Every single time you pray in fear, the devil gets clues on how to attack you because he's listening to your prayers. God ain't the only one listening to your prayers. The devil is eavesdropping like what you praying about this time. Here you go, scared again, praying again. Let me listen. I'm on this flight. And we, me, I'd made friends with somebody at the gate. And this dude let me know right out the, right out, like right out the gate, no pun intended. <laughs> he was like, what do you do? And I was like, oh, I'm a preacher, I'm a pastor. He was like, oh, don't, don't. Don't try to witness to me. <laughs> he was like... <laughs> I ain't, I ain't that dude. Don't, don't, don't try to preach to me. Don't try to evangelize me. I was like, bro, look, man. I had no intentions, actually. So live your life, man. We ended up, we're at the gate together, but then we ended up sitting next to each other. Halfway through the flight, turbulence hit. So I start jit you know, getting jittery, reclining my seat, palms getting sweaty, you know, forehead's getting sweaty. I'm clearly, like, visibly anxious. This uncircumcised Philistine. <laughs> looked at me. 
and said, I thought you said you was a Christian. Then he said these words. Oh, this ain't that ain't even the worst. He said, if the plane goes down, I'm the one that should be scared, not you. A non-Christian who was a believer, cool as a cucumber while turbulence is happening. A non-Christian who just believed the best is gonna happen. A non-Christian who's looking at a Christian who's not a believer. My flight anxiety got fixed that day. Because I realized this, a lack of faith is a bad witness. I can't call myself a Christian and be an unbeliever. Don't believe in the miraculous, I don't believe. What's the point actually? What's the point of, of being a Christian if you don't believe? Let me tell you something. If you were going to live your life based on what was rational and logical, baby, Christianity is the wrong religion for you. You, you, you had your chance before you got saved. You believe that a virgin had a baby. You realize, you realize how ridiculous this is. You are, it's too late. It's too late to start living rational and logical now. It's too late. You may as well believe God that he can do exceeding and abundantly beyond anything that you can ask, think, or imagine. You may as well believe that he can open up wombs. You may as well believe that he can send checks in the mail and provide for you. You may as well believe. And the God of the second and third and fourth and fifth chance, you may as well believe that he can resurrect broken dreams, that he can put failed marriages back together again. You may as well believe that your wayward son or daughter can come back into God's house. You may as well believe God for the miraculous. You believe that a virgin had a baby. You believe that that baby died for your sins. How? You don't know. You can't even explain it. How my sins get on him? I don't, I don't know. I just believe it. And then you believe that a couple days later, he rose from the dead with all power in his hands. It's too late to live a logical life now. It's too late to add it all up. It's too late. Me and my wife, six years of infertility. It's essentially six years of counting. You're counting everything. Counting which day to be intimate on, you're counting sperm cells, you're counting eggs, you're, count, you're just counting everything. And then I remember when they hit us with how much it was going to cost to do IVF. $25,000 cash got to be paid before you even start. And then God called me to be on the road full time. In January of 2020. In January, it was awesome. February, it was great. Then in the middle of March, I don't know, Tom Hanks got COVID. <laughs> Disney shut down. The NBA shut down, but not Texas. Texas was like, nah, we good. <laughs> we good. My income went from, God, you're awesome, to, God, where are you? Me and my wife whew, spent about $20,000 two times in the middle of a pandemic while I was essentially unemployed because God's math doesn't make any sense. His math doesn't make sense. None of the numbers work. None of them. We keep trying to add up where did this money come from? Random people sent us money. Random things that were supposed to cost a greater amount didn't cost because you know what? We decided we're just going to be believers. We're going to be believers. We're going to be believers. When your scenario says no, faith prepares for the miraculous anyway. Prepares for the miraculous. Come on. Jesus says to his mother Mary, these people with this wine at this wedding I got nothing to do with me. Ain't none of my business. And my hour's not yet come. What does Mary do? Leaves Jesus in a very socially awkward scenario. Mary hears a no, but says, servants, do whatever he tells you. She heard a no and prepared for a yes. You know what many of us are scared of? Come on, let's be real. You're scared to build an ark that never gets used. Oh, 
Jesus. I feel the Holy Spirit in the room. But can I tell you something? I'm more afraid of a supernatural downpour of God. And I was too scared to build an ark for it. I'm more scared of rain and having no ark than having an ark that stays in my backyard for a long time. So you know what me and my wife did in the middle of infertility? We bought a house that was bigger than any of us needed. Bought a crib, bought onesies. We heard no from every doctor we talked to, but prepared for yes. Heard no, heard no from, in the middle of a miscarriage, heard no, and guess what? Bought more onesies. I bought a diaper thing, I don't even know what to do. I'm gonna find out in a couple of weeks, you know what I'm saying? Get this, because we decided we're just gonna be believers. Every time we would go to the fertility clinic, I mean, there, it, every couple in there just sad. I remember the nurses saying, you're the only couple that walked in here with joy. And I said, it's because I know how this is going to end. I know exactly what the outcome is going to be. God is a God that wants to give us children. He's a good God. He's a good father through disappointment, through every valley. I'm a believer. Here's the last thing I'm going to say. I'm going to do an altar call. We over time. I'm sorry. Is the Holy Spirit speaking though? Okay. It's funny. I was watching the show Fixer Upper. It's like my favorite show in the world. It's my favorite show. And I remember I'm watching Fixer Upper. My wife busts in the room. She's like, are you crying? I was like, yeah. I'm crying because of Fixer Upper. She said, why are you crying? And I, sometimes you can't ask a preacher a question, you know? Because my response was, because when God found me, when God found me, the foundation of my life was all cracked and jacked up. My house was lean and crooked because my foundation was wrong. And God came through and poured a new foundation in my life. Why am I crying? Because there were dark corners and secrets all throughout my life. But baby, God came through like Joanna Gaines and put recess lighting all throughout my house. Why, why am I crying? I'm crying because I had built up walls of mistrust. I had built up walls because people had neglected me and abused me. And people had backtalked me and gossiped about me. But God began to knock down walls and God began to do demo day where I began to lick, expand the square footage of my life. Why? Why? Why am I crying? I'm crying because I'm the fixer-upper. I'm the fixer-upper. If there's anybody that I look at in scripture and I see a fixer-upper, oh, it's Rahab. Oh, not a, not a hero, but someone who just goes, don't matter where I started. I gave my whole life to the Lord. And I was in the middle of watching Fixer Upper. It's crazy how sometimes revelation comes to you. I'm in the middle of watching Fixer Upper, and the Holy Spirit says this. You see that it is structurally impossible to have a window without first having a wall. He's like, you realize that there is no such thing as a floating window. There's no such thing as a window suspended in air. And some of us are confused as to why God would allow the enemy to build a wall in your life, a wall of oppression, a wall of depression, a wall of anxiety. And God says, because I always let the devil do my dirty work for me. The enemy built that wall there so that I could come through and put a window in your wall. Oh, I want to put a window of opportunity in the middle of the wall that's trying to oppose you. God today is speaking to your faith. Do you see what the enemy has done or do you see what God is up to? Because what the enemy has meant for evil, God wants to turn it around for your good. He wants to put a window in your wall. If you're in the room today and you don't know Jesus, I'm going to do two altar calls. The first is just for salvation. If you don't know Jesus, but you want to start on your faith journey, can I tell you something? You can't start believing God for things without believing in Him first. So if you're in this room today, if you're in the balcony, if you're up here, if you're down here, and you're not a Christian, but you want to be, maybe you used to go to church a long time ago, maybe you would consider yourself to be backslidden, you're not a Christian, 
but you want Jesus. You want his forgiveness. You want a second chance. You want grace. You want mercy. You want to start your relationship with him with all heads bowed and all eyes closed. Can you just slip up your hand? Can you raise your hand at me? Can you raise? I see your hand. Can you raise your hand at me? I see your hand. I see your hand. I'm proud of you. I see your hand. I'm proud of you. Oh, I see your hand. I'm proud of you. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. I'm proud of you. Oh, come on. All, of rock, all across the room, I see hands. If that's you, come on, just wave at me. Just put your hand up in the air. Just pull it back down. I see you. I see your hand. Hey, I want us all to pray this prayer together. Tons of people just raise their hand. And to be completely honest, that's the whole point of why we're gathered here. So the lost people can be found. So the people can find Jesus. If we don't do anything else in this service, that's okay. You raise your hand and we want to pray with you. Come on, church. Christians, people who are praying this prayer for the first time, let's all pray this together. Jesus, thank you for mercy, for grace. I confess with my mouth. I believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord. He died for me, resurrected from the grave, ascended into heaven and coming back one day to judge the living and the dead. I, come on with power, I am a new creation in Christ from this day forward. Oh, if you just prayed that prayer for the first time, oh, we wanna clap for you. Oh, we're proud of you. Come on, today's the first day of the rest of your life. Hallelujah. Now, if you're in this room and you've been struggling with doubt, Pastor Jordan, I almost forgot. Come on, tech, there's a text prompt. Oh, follow, there we go. They put it up. If you just prayed that prayer for the first time, can you text the word life to 469-715-3755? If you would do that, we'd love to follow up with you. We'd love to follow up with you. Here we go. If you're in the room and you're a Christian, you're a believer, but you've been struggling with doubt. Just struggling with doubt. Disappointments have turned into doubt. Doubt has turned into unbelief. Yeah. And, and you know, you gotta, you gotta start seeing windows instead of walls. You're in the room and you literally feel like there's just been a wall between you and your next season, between you and everything God promised you. You feel like the enemy's almost, you almost feel spiritually claustrophobic. You feel like the enemy's just kind of boxed you in. You feel walled in. But for a split second today while I was preaching, you started to see a window open up. A window into your future. A window into what God wants to do in your life. If that's you today, you just wave at me, I wanna pray for you. Just wave at me, I wanna pray for you. Hands going up all across the room. Come on, can you stand up on your feet? And there's intercessors, there's a prayer team. Ready? Come on. If, if you want prayer, can you come down here? You can come on down here. I just want to lay my hands on you and pray for you. If you're here in the, in the building and you need your faith recharged, we're going to go back into a time of worship. Come on. Faith. We declare faith over your life in the name of Jesus. Supernatural faith over your life in Jesus' name. We take authority over every form of doubt, over every seed of disappointment, and we speak faith over your life right now in Jesus' name. Come on, the windows of heaven are open over you. We declare windows of opportunity available to you. Come on, all across the room, if you can't make it down here, can we just lift up our hands and take authority over the atmosphere? We declare right now in this moment, that doubt will not have the final word. No disappointing moment will have the final word. God, we thank you in your name that your spirit is moving through the room and we thank you for supernatural faith in the name of Jesus as we lay hands on people at this altar and pray for them. God, I pray right now for broken dreams to come back to life. God, we thank you right now in Jesus' name. And like the army of Jericho, we praise you like it's already done. We praise you like you've already accomplished it in the name of Jesus.